Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I really want to look around the room and say Shabbat Shalom. And you're not here. You're not here. You will be here. You'll be here soon. I don't know when, but you'll be here soon. We're watching every metric possible to see when the first time we can permit people to come even in small numbers to daven in the building. It's not going to be this week or next week, maybe next month. And as I've been saying and been writing throughout, we're taking into account all possibilities. As you imagine the high holidays, which are coming sooner rather than later. But for now, I'm here, and you're there, and your sanctuary is your home, and your home is your sanctuary. And here's some thoughts for Parshat Emor. When you look in the mirror, whom do you see? What do you see? And someone asks you, who are you? What's your answer? And what would it be if you thought about it rather than just gave a knee-jerk answer? When we meet people for the first time, one of the first questions that's asked is, what do you do? And that question begs an answer related to our job. So we meet someone and we find out soon, I'm a teacher, I'm an electrician, I make candles, I'm an attorney. Social convention has us pigeonholing ourselves when we make acquaintances, almost convincing us that our work is the totality of who we are. And the pace and the calendar of life dictate that as well. Now, I am someone who, as I would hope that you know, is committed to my job and my career. I feel great satisfaction in my work, and I enjoy it, and I am blessed to do it. I'm nourished by it, even and especially on a day like today. And I, yet I remember a sense of sadness when I realized at some point early on in my life just how many of one's good waking hours are devoted to a profession that you mostly choose in your 20s or to a job that you might have landed in by happenstance. Cosmically speaking, on a layer of world meaning, was I born into this world primarily to be a rabbi? Is that why God created me? Did God create you for you to do the job that you're doing? Or are there loftier purposes beyond our job descriptions? My contribution to this week's Table for Five in the Jewish Journal focused on the Kohen Gadol and what must be sacrificed when one lives a life of service. I want to expand on that and offer some balance this morning. I'm not sure that being a Kohen, a priest, was such a cushy job back in the days. There were really high expectations of those who served. It's true, you didn't have to work for your income. The truma tax that we discussed before imposed on the Israelites sustained the Kohanim. But on the other hand, that meant that a Kohen's subsistence depended not on their own industriousness, but on the goodwill and the obedience to the law of the people, and a people who did not always do as they were told. To serve as a Kohen was to do the important work of managing the spiritual side of Jewish life. And to do so was hard work. I think there was an emotional challenge to the work as well as we saw in the beginning of the Parsha. <coughs> in the opening lines of Parsha Amor, we're told that a Kohen had to be constantly alert, constantly on call. Imagine a doctor who never had a weekend or a night off. Perhaps imagine a doctor during a pandemic. A doctor always on call, ready at any moment to rush to work. Think of how limited this doctor's experience of the world would be. Limited travel in a world where you could travel to ensure that he could make it to the hospital in an emergency. No wine or beer ever or casual drinking lest she find herself needed for a procedure and even slightly impaired by the glass of wine. The work would be fulfilling to serve the health of other people, but also constraining. I think that was the reality of the Kohanim, because serving in the temple required them to be tahor, flowing with life. They could not afford to allow themselves contact with anything that would make them tamay, or touching death. And principally, they needed to avoid contact with a corpse, 
lest their being tame would prevent them from offering a sacrifice for those who were still alive or doing some other task. We might tend to think of it as a benign limitation, right? Who really would feel held back by the prohibition of touching a corpse? Indeed, it's a limitation nearly all of us put on ourselves anyway. When was the last time you did that? But I want you to remember how death and mourning took place in the ancient world. There were no professional intermediaries. When someone died, the person's family and friends personally attended to the burial. That was how you showed respect for the deceased. That's how the process of mourning began. Being kept away from that process meant having to find alternate avenues for mourning and coping and meant being away from the group that was gathered to say goodbye. Has there ever been a moment in human history where we understood better than we do today the onerousness of such a restriction? Today, we're all potential kohanim, unable to be with our loved ones as they die, and potentially not even there as they are buried. To this day, observant kohanim who are descendants, we believe, of those original priests, they stay away from funerals and funerals and cemeteries. You might have seen them lingering outside a funeral home or hoping to hear the words of the eulogy from far away. They might come to the edge of the cemetery to watch the burial of a close friend. I would think that would be a hard thing to impose on oneself, to be apart and distant when your urge would be to be close and present and a part of the rituals and sacred conversations that often take place at a graveside. And again, those of us living through this moment can understand that pain of being far when you most want to be near. Now, if this were all we knew about the Kohen's world, we would rightly assume that the Kohen's significance to the Jewish people superseded any individual's value or need. If you asked a Kohen, who are you? The simple answer would be, clear and obvious, I'm a Kohen. Who am I? I'm a priest. Who am I? I'm one who serves the people. That's who I am. It's clear from the law. But two exceptions to the rule about touching a corpse can help us understand the Torah's concern for a life of balance, a life of multiple duties and commitments, even for the ancient Kohanim. The first exception, as we spoke about at the beginning of the Parsha, was for immediate family, for every Kohen except the Kohen Gadol. As you may know, there are seven family members for whom a Jew must formally mourn or sit Shiva and say Kaddish. Mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter, God forbid, and spouse. These are the very family members for whom the Kohen was permitted to defile himself to tend to their burials. The category of spouse, by the way, was added by the rabbis to the ones listed explicitly in the Torah. If it was so important that the Kohen retain his tahara, why the exception for family? He still needed to be on call. One answer offered in the Talmud is the concern that if the Kohen didn't make arrangements for a family member, nobody would. And for such, because such arrangements were usually taken care of by family. My friend and colleague, Rabbi Robert Alper, offers a different answer. The Kohen's special status was earned how? Solely on family pedigree. He didn't do anything to deserve that simply by being born into that family to those parents. A Kohen is born set apart, earmarked for sanctity, whether he wants it or not. And so he must honor his immediate family who bequeathed him that special role by participating in their funerals, even if it takes him away temporarily from being able to serve the people at large. I think the living lesson, le living lesson is that we must honor the family structure that defines who we are. No job is so sacred that it deserves to completely push aside family bonds. When a family member dies, a Kohen is not a priest or a communal servant. A Kohen is a father and a husband and a brother and a son. How much more so is that true for us? Professional duty is, at times, the only thing we must focus on given our line of work. And professional duty, professional duty is, at times, circumscribed by things in life that are just more important. And as non-Kohanim, part of the challenge of life is determining when to let our family roles play most prominently. 
In certain situations, the calculation is clear. If a child is sick, we stay home rather than go to work. Hopefully, our employers understand. If there's a family bris, you take a personal day. But what about the non-obvious cases? How do we import this wisdom into our overall approach to how we spend our days without, of course, neglecting the responsibilities of our jobs? Well, there's another exception which broadens the sense of self and instructs the Kohen to recognize his duties to humanity, not just his family, that rise above his job description. A Kohen was also obligated to defile himself for what's called a mate mitzvah, a corpse that lacks anyone to bury it. If a Kohen came upon an unburied course, corpse, he did not pause to consider how the defilement would impact his duty in the temple because his duty in the temple was merely laying the infrastructure for the higher duty expected by God of all of us. And that's the duty to treat one another with dignity and to see each human being as being in God's image. No person in God's image is, deserves to be left unburied. And so the Kohen's conventional duty of remaining prepared to work in the temple yielded to the absolute duty of taking care of God's creations. Tending to the mate mitzvah would have the Kohen say of himself, I am a priest, but I'm not just a priest. I'm a fellow human being. I'm a creation of God like this dead person before me. I am a soul in many ways no different than any other that God created. Now the balance goes both ways. I don't want you to misunderstand me as reading the tradition pushing us away from taking our jobs seriously, God forbid. And so I want to invoke with pride the teaching of the Rambam, Maimonides, who's, who said that Jews must have a livelihood no matter, no matter how much Torah they want to study, no matter how much they think they are a servant of God. They may want to spend all their time doing sacred things. The Rambam says they are obligated to work. Why? Because for the Rambam, Maimonides, the issue was industriousness and generativity. You have to be involved in some labor or some productive purpose that helps move the work along. And you have to be as committed to that as you are committed to your sacred duties. Because he believed that that commitment to secular productivity was instrumental in actually living out your life as a person of religious faith. The Rambam understood that we need structure in our lives too, more structure even than is afforded by unadorned ritual and study. I want to add another important reason to work, which is even more resonant during this era of working through and be committed to it. In this day and age, we're just not Kohanim. Not even Kohanes are Kohanim. They might be descendants of them, might, but the chain of that transmission, some people believe, is lost. But even if they are descendants, they're not serving in a temple. They have jobs like the rest of us. We all have to work for our sustenance these days. Sometimes harder than we'd like to. We've got to earn it. For these and many other reasons, it's important to be committed to our work. Committed to it, but not necessarily only defined by it at all times. And in this human moment, above all others, perhaps, it's a wise thing to be exceedingly grateful to have work if we have it, and I am, given so many who lack it and who are suffering as a result. And if we have work, to be committed to it. I imagine a Kohen might have felt pulled in different directions, pulled by conflicting commitments. It's a feeling to which we can all relate. There's a midrash from the collection called the Michilta that suggests that in laying out the terms of the Kohen's duty, God understood the sensitivity of the issue. The verb most commonly used to describe God's talking to anyone in the Torah is, as many of you know, daber, by daber Adonai Amoshe Lemor, daber al Bnei Yisrael, God spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel, dalid bet resh daber. In a few cases, the verb used is emor, amar, Aleph, Mem, Resh, like in the name of our Parsha. Now, we might generally just translate the words the same way. They both can mean speak. They both can mean say. 
But the Mechilta notices that emor is used when a softer tone would be called for. And the rules of the Kohen in this week's Parsha are introduced by an emor, which is the name of the Parsha. It's as if God used gentle language to lay out the rules in the following way. Kohanim, I request of you to be focused on your temple obligations and not to defile yourself. I request. I don't demand with Deber. I request with Amar. It's a subtle distinction because obviously it was a command in some way. It was an obligation. But it was an obligation suggested by the Mechilta that's softened by God's understandings of the feelings of the Kohanim who were called into duty perhaps without their volition. How pulled they were. How dual devotions were a real challenge then as they are today. Maybe when we speak to others and to ourselves about balancing work with family and work with leisure and work with life, we should employ the same soft understanding tone, a tone which is yielding and leaves room for exceptions and flexibility, a tone which recognizes that to be human is not to be a worker, it is to be a liver and a lover. To be industrious is not to be a slave. It is to be a contributor and a provider. And to be alive is to be living the life, mostly, that you want and deserve to live. Who are you? What is your ideal answer to that question if you thought about it? Some of who we are is out of our control. But which things that are in your control can you manipulate and change so that you like your own answer to that question better? To paraphrase the great text, free to be you and me, what we all hope for, for ourselves and for our children, is to grow up not to be teachers or priests or rabbis or doctors only, but rather to grow up to be people, perhaps people with children, busy with work and also busy with living. Shabbat Shalom.